the opportunity to present this work in, in here. And this is a work during, well, it has been done in collaboration with Tony Pick and Ignacy Rossell from Valencia. And this is just a quick outline of the, of, of the talk. First, I will provide the motivation of the standard electroweak symmetry, okay, electroweak symmetry breaking and the computation of this parameter. And in the second part, the effective Lagrangian that we will use and the, the computation of the, of the relevant correlator. Uh, a crucial detail will be the, that we will impose uh, high energy constraints and finally the, well, we'll see some numbers. So what? What we have performed is the one loop calculation of the oblique S parameter okay, with Higgs-less uh, models for electroweak symmetry breaking. Uh, why? Well, if eventually at the end of the day there, there is no Higgs, well, one should look for alternative ways for, for mass generation in like a strongly coupled Higgs models. And how the way how we have performed this computation is through an effective approach where taking into account that the electroweak symmetry breaking is actually pretty similar to, the <coughs> to, to that that you find in, in QCD for chiral symmetry breaking. Okay, where it is described through, where the Goldstone interaction is described through chiral perturbation theory. Um, <coughs> we, use, we use also that and take into account that many strongly coupled Higgs-less models also produce resonances like in QCD. <coughs> and therefore it, we think that it's proper also to use the, the, the theory that we use in, in, in QCD. Uh, Sometimes, <laughs> some people here, there could be also the discussion, which is resonance chiral theory. And we'll be the, the Lagrangian with at most two derivatives, and we'll impose, uh, we, we will impose also further uh, short distance conditions. And uh, we'll use this, and we'll plug it in the dispersive representation from Peskin and Takeuchi. Uh, so, well, uh, Higgs -less set why Higgs -less set electro wheel resonance models in uh, string phenomenology? Well, essentially because uh, many string theory constructions contain a tower of vector and axial vector resonances, which is what really matters in, in this, in this observable. And this is actually the only place where you see the word string in, <laughs> in this talk. So actually all I, all I, all I want is the, tower, is the tower of resonances that, for instance, you also have in holographic constructions. Um, <coughs> So, strongly, so we look at the strongly coupled models, Higgs-less, where you have a non-perturbative electroweak symmetry breaking, and instead of uh, one has compound uh, resonance states, instead of the... So it's like a technical uh, type model? Yeah, for instance. But and uh, are you compatible with 125 uh, GB? Uh, uh, 125 GB for the, for the vector? No. But, uh, well... I won't be compatible, but let's wait for the for the <laughs> for uh, for the end of the game. Uh, far from compatible. Far from compatible. Okay, so well, there are many many uh, options, um, even many technical. Or so essentially, what what we do is okay. We have electroweak symmetry. Electroweak symmetry breaking, sim similar to chiral symmetry breaking, okay, of SU2 left and SU2 right into the custodial group. And actually, at low energies, it has the same effective field, one has the same effective field theory pi on Lagrangian to describe the, the interactions of the, of the Goldstone, similar to chiral perturbation theory. And in particular, one of these uh, ways of breaking the symmetry is the standard model, where at energies much much lower than the Higgs mass. Well, it one has the operators <coughs> of the current symmetry breaking, but instead, instead of F pi, what you have is the, the V from the, from the electroweak sector. Uh, therefore, we have, so we will include, we'll construct the effective theory for the Goldstones, where the standard model uh, gauge symmetry is non-linearly non realized, uh, plus the lighter resonances from, uh, from the strongly coupled Higgs-less models. Uh, we'll make a construction, a construction similar to resonance chiral theory in QCD. And, well, incidentally, if one performs the, the most naive rescaling from QCD to the electroweak 
uh, uh, scales. This is from f pi uh, of 90 MeV to V of 246 TeV, and we just move everything. Uh, the masses go to the to the range of the of the first resonances would go to the range of the TV, but uh, uh, okay. Remember, remember this order of magnitude when we we go to the result. But indeed, uh, I'm not going to use this kind of game at all during the calculation. Uh, and then the last, what we are actually doing is estimating this parameter, which is essentially equivalent to the determination of the chiral perturbation theory low energy constant, the L10, okay, in, in KPT or and in resonance chiral theory. So the precise definition of this electroweak precision observable is just, well, it's given by this uh, W3B correlator okay, at low energies and indeed uh, uh, one, subtract, one subtracts the, the standard model, the theoretical standard model contribution from the, from the SD, from the, in the definition of the S parameter. Okay, so in such a way that what you, f what you see is deviations from the standard model. Peskin and Takeuchi actually wrote, well, wrote were able to, to express this in terms of our dispersive uh, representation where actually all you need to know is the, the spectral function of the of this correlator and thanks to that okay, of your of your theory and you subtract the standard model and thanks to, th to that you you can actually extract the s parameter uh, but one has to keep okay one has to i mean just looking at this expression one has to uh, take into account well, first two important well okay one has to take into account two important things the first thing is that the spectral ha function must fulfill a uh, vanishing behavior at high energies, at short distances. And the other important thing is that the, in the same way as the L10 low energy constant in chiral perturbation theory is always defined for some arbit arbitrary renormalization scale mu, S is always defined for an arbitrary reference scale uh, MH. Okay. Well. Um, and Thus, we construct, we construct our effective field theory uh, with at most two derivatives, and later we will add some further short distance information where we include the, so, uh, the standard model gauge bosons, the goldstones, and the first vector and axial vector resonances. Okay, then we have operators without resonances, operators, the general set of operators with one resonance field, and also operators with two resonance fields. But Actually, we, uh, at the end of the day, we'll see that only two combinations of couplings enter in the, in the, in the observable. And <coughs> I'm counting the number of parameters that, I mean, after doing the computation, if, when you count the number of parameters of your, that, uh, that enter into in your determination, we have seven resonance parameters. And here, well, the, the high energy constraints pl will play a a crucial role. Okay, at lean order, the thing is pretty trivial. One has the three zero correlator, okay, and then the three level exchanges, and therefore at low energies, one has the <coughs> one has the, the, the usual the usual formula. Uh, at next to lean order, you have all all these all these one loop diagrams, all these possible one loop diagrams. And thanks to a one subtraction, to a one subtracted dispersive relation, uh, <coughs> where you, where we plug in the three-level and one-loop spectral functions, it's possible to recover the the full correlator. Okay, and indeed we, we consider the pi pi cut, the vector pi cut, actual pi, pi cut, and actually as you go to higher and higher thresholds, the contributions to this parameter, which uh, is more and is more and more <coughs> suppressed in the in the dispersive integral, and and then this uh, okay this uh, expression actually takes this this form where you have the the renormalized three level contributions plus the the absorptive contributions uh, from, from one-loop diagrams. 
and when you go to low energies, okay, these terms give this term, and you have a contribution from the absorptive uh, one-loop diagrams. Okay, and now the, the other, uh, the, one of the crucial points is the high energy constraints. So the thing is that, uh, in, constra I mean, in contrast with QCD, we ignore what is the underlying theory. So what we do is, uh, we work with a series of hypotheses, and uh, from that, from those hypo hypotheses, we we extract conclusions. And so this is actually what what we do. So essentially, if you look at the operator product expansion at short distances for for the three zero correlator, for the W3B uh, correlator, <coughs> in depending on the, on the dimension of the first operator that you, ha that you have in the operator product expansion, if the uh, dimension of the operator is larger than two, as it happens in, in the technicolor models, then you have that your uh, spectral function fulfills the first Van Bersen rules. And in the case uh, when the, the dimension of the operator is larger than four, then you also have, like in asymptotic, uh, like in asymptotically free uh, mo models, you also have the second Weinberg sum, sum rule. So therefore, <coughs> uh, at lean order, at three level, you will have one or two constraints depending on whether you take the first Weinberg sum rules or the two Weinberg sum rules. Uh, for the imaginary part, the analysis of the, of the spectral function at next to lean order will give us three or four constraints depending on if we take uh, one or two Van Bersen rules and the analysis of the real part at next to lean order will help us to, to, de to determine and to constrain the, the renormalized resonance couplings. And in addition, uh, I mean in the bibliography you, you may find different, different constraints that the people, that the people uh, study, like the, what is many times called the unitarity bound, which, re which refers to the WW scattering, or the pi pi vector form factor, I mean the constraint that this form factor vanishes, or the pi gamma axial form factor, that the requirement that, uh, that this constraint vanishes. So if, if we now count all, all the constraints that we are able to, to gather, well, we, are, we can gather up to nine, seven constraints, depending on whether you take two inversion rules or just one in your, in your hypothesis. And in principle, it's, it's not possible to, to fulfill all the constraints at the same time, because remember that we are also cutting the, we are, we are cutting the tower of resonances, so it's impossible to really fulfill everything exactly. So what we do is we, we play with sets of constraints, and we check that the other constraints are approximately fulfill and that the results that you uh, the outcomes that comes from the different analysis uh, are consistent with I with each other so then wh what happens with the with the phenomenology okay so this is the this is the experimental number okay for this reference scale of the uh, of the higgs and if you take the leading order result uh, actually what you uh, with two inversion rules, uh, some rules, you have uh, this nice prediction. And actually, if you only had uh, one inversion rule, but uh, still you have the hierarchy of the axial, uh, of the first axial being higher, uh, heavier than the, than the vector, you can uh, still derive a, a, a lower bound for the, for the S parameter. So essentially, you, would, you can predict the lower curve and uh, your S parameter would be in the in the shaded in the shaded region, in the shaded area. So essentially, the, the the prediction that you have at at lean order is that the mass of the vector must be over the 1.5 TeV at the three sigma level. Uh, what happens if you, okay, uh, then people try to to lower this uh, this scale by analyzing the the one loop corrections. So what happens if you have two inversion rules? Okay, if you have, if you consider the, the first and second inversion rule at lean order and next to lean order, you get uh, six constraints, and <coughs> and then the only free parameter that remains is the mass of the vector. <coughs> uh, 
and this leads uh, to, to eight solutions, which I plot here. And indeed, uh, among these solutions, there are some solutions which are completely clear. Even if they look pretty much the same, and the predictions are pre pretty much the same, what we consider the actually good solutions are only two of them, which are compatible with the, with the vector form factor, axial form factor, and scattering constraints. Which, uh, which suffer small deviations of the order of ten, ten, tens percent uh, for, for these constraints. Okay, and if, if you use alternative sets of constraints from, from the first and second, sorry, oh, from the first and second Weinberg rules and the vector for factor and sec four factors constraints, you get even uh, more stringent bound. But if, if you remain, okay, if you keep the, the least stringent constraint, the most you can do is to, to reach your, low, your lower bound for, for MV up to 1.8 TV at 3 sigma. Okay, if you remove the second Weinberg rule, now you can <coughs> all, uh, you can already, one minute, okay, you can fulfill, you can fulfill the Weinberg rule with, uh, with only the pi pi. And actually the expression, f in the case that MA is larger than MB, you can extract a lower, a lower bound and indeed, in this case, the expression is extremely simple. Okay, you can very clearly see the, the structure of the corrections. And, and again, the bound is, is the same as before. And if you add also the, the next uh, uh, threshold, the, the contribution from the next threshold, from uh, VPI and API, <coughs> essentially you get uh, two solutions, okay, or two families of solutions. The green ones were the, if you increase the ratio between axial and vector, you go up, and the red one, that if you increase the ratio of axial over vector, you go down. So from, from, the, from the green ones, you get, again, the same, the same lower bound. And for the red one, in principle, you could, you could really decrease the, the lower bound up to uh, a few GV. But the, the, the price you have to pay is really big. Well, first, there are huge violation, violations of the second um, Weinberg rule, which is not really a big problem because it's not the hypothesis you do here. But in addition, you have huge corrections to the first one version rule and next in order, large splitting between axial and vector. And even in this case, the axial never goes below the one TV. So then conclusions. Uh, uh, we have performed improvements uh, with respect to previous next in order calculation. We use dispersive cal calculation with no physical uh, ultraviolet cutoffs, more generic, more general Lagrangian, uh, introducing short distance information, and um, from the analysis of leading order and actually in order with different hypotheses, the result is that in general the higher resonance mass scale is, is always uh, well beyond the, the one TV and future war oblique T parameter, and possibly find uh, some dispersive representation. And sorry for the extra <coughs> minute. <coughs> I didn't understand, and uh, mm -hmm. um, so you, you say you're not compatible with uh, Higgs at 125. Uh, ah, no, 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 no. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry, sorry. No, uh, no. I, I thought you were talking about vectors in the GV, uh -huh. in the GV range. Right. I mean, the 100 GV. So, is it or compatible 500. with the Higgs at 125? Uh, Actually, the thing is that all. Okay. All this, okay. All this is thought for for Higgsless. Right. So the the, the 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 okay the regularization. Okay, in the standard model, if you remember this uh, this dispersive integral, the the behavior of the spectral function goes to zero because of a precise cancellation between the Goldstone Goldstone channel and the, well, the pi pi channel and the pi Higgs channel. At high energies, they cancel each other. If you don't have this, uh, the, the pi, if you don't have the Goldstone channel, uh, sorry, if you don't have the Higgs channel, then uh, this regularization of the behavior at high energies n needs to happen in some other way. What happens if there is Higgs? Then? No, I mean, are, are you compatible with the resonance at 125 or not? I mean, you know, it's. it's uh, <coughs> But you, mean, uh, but you mean a, sc a scalar resonance? No, it's, it's, it's a resonance, whatever they observed. They observed uh, <coughs> the resonance at 
125 GB. Are you compatible with it or not? I mean, you know, this is the data. Are you compatible with the data or not? I mean, you know. Yes, but the data. Okay, I mean, but I, I, but I, I am not asking then you. Then there is the issue of interpretation of the data. So you can interpret it as a fundamental scalar, or you can, in your scenario, interpret it at a bound state. So <coughs> okay, so let me let me tell you. Let me repeat. All this is assuming that there is no a scalar state. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. Okay, if, they, if there compatible with, with the resonance at 125 GB. Okay, if, if there was okay, if there were a, a, a scalar at one uh, at, at one hundred one hundred twenty five GV, yeah. okay. We could uh, still think of uh, we'd have to modify this right. in the sense of there could be the two scenarios where you have the resonances where the cancellation at high energies could happen between an interplay of the pi pi channel and the Goldstone uh, sorry, and the Higgs pi channel. So okay, let's uh, let's move on to the next speaker. So thank you very much again.